is a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me
heaven is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Well, hello. We're glad you joined us. And my wife and I are just going to share a bit of what God is doing in our lives and what God wants to do in your life. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, the message today is really all about when we trust God, we don't need to worry because we don't need to be in control. And why is that? Because God is great and we don't need to fear the future. Because God is good, we don't need to look elsewhere. And because God is gracious, we don't need to prove ourselves that we have some strength and our ability uh, to make things happen. So if these things are true of God, we are in a relationship with him through Jesus. We don't need to worry. So that's the main message for today. And I've asked Barb to come and just share what you're learning and what might be an, an encouragement to us. And then she'll lead us in prayer. And then we'll get into the scripture for today. So Barb, okay. glad you're here. Well, I would like to start out by saying... Um, Again, how much we miss you. I do think there's really something to getting together corporately and being able to greet each other with a holy hug and just have that connection and that heart. The heart is connected to the physical, and so we miss you. We miss you greatly. Um, so that kind of has led me to be thinking about what we've been going through these last weeks, months, and um, I feel like probably what I'm going to say may be a little late because what what we're coming to the end of this, and I think it's probably going to be when you watch this that we'll have already been looking forward to coming together. So I look forward to seeing you. But it's reminded me of some of my thought life, what I've been doing these last months. And um, honestly, I've found myself remembering with a lot of memories, remembering the richness of what we've gone through in life, our time in Asia and, and how we've seen people come to Christ or our family vacations or places we've lived and the relationships we've had. And I have like this screen that is going through my mind, and I've thought, you know, if I hadn't had the time to take to do this, I probably would just be on that treadmill still. So I'm grateful for this time to have been able to do that because it reminded me to remember. And so often, we don't remember. We don't do those pinion times of what the Israelites went through when they would forget what God had done. And it's an important principle to put into our lives to say, I remember God that you did this in this time and to trust that and to lean into it. So it, with that in mind, I went back and I just even went to some scriptures to say, how did the Israelites remember and how we could remember? And the Israelites, did it by often setting up an altar. And they, their altars were not always for sacrifice. For them, many times it was to mark an event or an appearance of God or a revelation or a time to remember how God was faithful. You think of uh, Jacob, you know, when he had the angels going up and down the ladder or Abraham or Noah. The very first one was Noah when they came out of the ark. What did he do? He built an altar. So that's a time to mark God's faithfulness to us. And in the early times, they were certainly done mostly in certain spots where that happened. But what I'd like to bring us to is to remember how that happened often for the Israelites. And a particular example of that is in Joshua. In chapter 4, and after God had parted the River Jordan for the Israelites to cross over it, um, together, 
all the Israelites came together and they built an altar of 12 stones and it was to represent each of the tribes. So it was something to represent all of them. And Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. So often these sacrifices or, sacrifices or altars were built as a memorial, as a place to remember. And we've done this as a family I've challenged all of our family to do it somehow. Whether it's in the house that you're in and you remember something that God has done, he's come through in a big way. He's either done a work in your heart or he's answered a need or he's healed someone or you've trusted him and been able to lean in your faith in a very much more deep way. Um, way to remember that is to build an altar. And you literally could take a stone and do a word or a couple words, write it out on the stone and put it in your backyard or put it in a corner of the house and remember. And those are the times when you're feeling down, you can go back and say, ooh, I remember when God did that and how I felt and how I could trust his faithfulness. So that in this moment, when it's hard, when I'm saying, where are you, God? When I'm saying, my heart is wavering, faltering, I can go back and remember and po point to that and not be like the Israelites, to forget. So that's what our journey here on earth is, to remember how faithful, how gracious, how big, how grand, how good he is. And so I'd like to challenge you to do that. And if you don't do it in a tangible way with stones, there's lots of ways to build an altar. You can write a journal and you can always go back and remember. Or if you're more creatively bent and you wanna do creative memory type pages to scrap it or to um, collage, whatever you wanna do to use your gifting, your way of expressing yourself and just take time to monumentalize it, to say, I remember God when you did this. And it helps us as humans to lean into that, to trust it, to, to have a tangible way to say, oh, that takes my heart back to when I knew what God did to me it was so real, so tangible, and be able to tie your heart into that. So I pray that for you as we start to come back together. Mark it. Mark what God has done in your life during these times and remember. Remember him. So Tom, before you preach or talk to us, I'd like to lead us in a prayer and let's take our hearts to him together, okay? Bow with me. Lord, we thank you. We adore you. We worship you this morning because of who you are, because you still are God, because you still reign, because you still have all power and glory and omniscience over this earth. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust ourselves to you, not only our physical well-being, but our emotional and our hearts, our spiritual side. And so we do that. We mark that this morning to say, you are God. You are the I am that I am. And so as we go to your word, I ask that you would reveal to us and keep us really tender and spiritually sensitive to how you want us to hear your voice this morning. Lead us in the scripture. Lead us in Tom's words. Anoint him with your Holy Spirit, I pray. And I pray it in the precious name of our Jesus. Amen. See you Amen. soon. Thank you, Barb. You know, baseball season is not meeting yet. They're talking about having uh, games without anybody in the stadium. But I kind of feel like Barb was the third hitter in the lineup or the fourth hitter, you know, the cleanup batter. And I'm uh, coming in to pinch hit. Uh, 
thanks. That was important for us to remember to remember. In fact, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, we don't need to be taught new things. What we really need to be doing is remembering what God has done for us and be reminded of those things. So Barb's given us some ideas of how we can set those memorials. Uh, so thank you. Really, my outline for today is very simple. Number one, life is bigger than what you worry about. Number two, your Heavenly Father is with you today, and He knows about your tomorrow. And number three, are you trusting Him, or have you put your trust in worry? So we're going to look at those three points, but the main point for today, when Jesus was on this planet, he taught something brand new, and he launched a brand new way of experiencing relationship between God and us. He taught that we are to see every aspect of our lives through a filter of his love and his grace. He said, I want you to love one another just as I have loved you. He also claimed to be the resurrection and the life, and he claimed to be God. And then he died, bringing into question all that he had said and done. But just recently, you know, we, we celebrated his resurrection. He rose from the dead, putting an exclamation point on every word he said and every promise he made. Then he told his followers he wanted them to launch a whole new movement. The way he planned this new movement would be successful is by giving some very specific commands to his followers, followers. And if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are among that group that he gave these commandments to. And he expected us to fulfill them. For example, he says, go and make disciples. Another place he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In another place he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Keep that Priority number one. But I want us to take one other command, which is included in, in the context of seeking first his kingdom. And that command is, he says, do not worry. He did, uh, how does he expect us to follow that command? I mean, how do we stop worrying? I mean, we say, okay, I'm supposed to not worry, so don't worry, but I'm worried about this. So how did, we're going to talk about how we can overcome the anxiety and the fears that arise due to our worry. I want to tell you a story that happened in 1976. I was playing soccer at uh, Nyack College, a college up in New York, and we were having this great competition with this other university, and we had one player on the team, his name was Paul Campbell. We called him the Condor because Paul just had a build. He was, he was wiry and he was fast and he could jump sky high. And so as he went up to head a ball, the opposing player jumped up to head the same ball and they cracked heads. And as soon as they cracked heads, I mean, we knew, all knew this is bad because you could just hear the crack. And then the other player fell to, his, fell to the ground unconscious. And Paul was like, okay, what happened? Uh, let's keep playing. And of course, the ref blew the whistle. And what had happened is when that player got hit in his head so hard, he swallowed his tongue. Now, we didn't know that, but we were all standing there watching this guy start to turn blue, and none of us knew what to do. And finally, a bunch of us just knelt down and we started praying, God, help this guy. We don't know what to do. Fortunately, there was a nurse that was in the crowd and she came running out on the field and she got down and, and reached into his mouth and was able to dislodge his tongue. But what was happening at that moment is that poor guy was being strangulated by his tongue and he couldn't breathe and he there was nothing he could do. He was going to die right there on the field. Fortunately, they got him to the hospital, and he recovered from that terrible accident. But the topic for today is focused on a command that Jesus gives that says, do not let 
a kind of strangulation happen in your life. And the phrase for strangulation that I'm using is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. The phrase is, do not worry. Now, you might be wondering, why would I connect strangulation and this command, don't worry? Well, number one, it's repeated three times in Matthew chapter 6. So Jesus is trying to get across this point. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And the word worry in the English language comes from a German word which means strangle. Isn't that interesting? That the Germans, and then we borrowed this, this word from them, it almost sounds like worry. It's, uh, I don't know the spelling of the German, but it, it, come, it, it sounds almost like they're saying worry. And it means, in their language, to strangle, meaning it causes mental distress and mental trouble. This is what worry does. It gets its emotional, mental hands around our necks and it strangles us. It causes us to take our attention off of all those things we're supposed to be focusing on because our mind is fixated and it's preoccupied on that mental trouble that keeps coming up late at night when we can't sleep, or early in the morning when we wake up, that worry, that dread. And it's almost like a strangulation uh, which consumes us and distracts us. So now we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. You can get your Bible out, open it up to Matthew 6, and we're going to go uh, verse by verse of what Jesus is trying to say to us when he says not to worry. Now, I want you to keep a couple things in mind as we look at these verses. Jesus taught this message early in his ministry. So he was just starting out in his public ministry. There was a crowd out in front of him on, sitting on a hill, and the sermon that he's preaching, Matthew chapter 6, is the Sermon on the Mount. So it's one of his most famous sermons early in his ministry. And also, when we read this, we might think, well, how ridiculous. How am I supposed to stop worrying? I mean, what's the deal here, Lord? If I say I'm worried, the next thing I hear is, well, stop worrying. And so we say, okay, I'll stop worrying, but, but I'm worried about this. And yet Jesus says three times, don't worry. And he, it's the same word, but he uses a different fo a verb form in each of those phrases. The first one is stop worrying. The second is don't start worrying. And the third is don't worry. So three different verb forms. If you're worrying, stop. If you're not worrying, don't start. Then in your everyday life, don't worry. In other words, don't be anxious. Don't be strangled by the trouble you think might happen. So here is how he said it. And as we go through this, I want you to remember, Jesus knew something that all of us know, but most of us forget, just like Barb was saying. We have this tendency to, to just kind of go on with life and we get busy and we forget the things that we know, but we need to be reminded of those things. In these verses, Jesus is asking five questions of all of us. The crazy thing is we know the answer to these questions, but we often forget. Question number one, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Who can, by your worry, add a single hour to life? Second question, who of you, by worrying, has probably taken a year off your life? <laughs> I mean, science tells us, medical uh, experts tell us, anxiety, worry, will take our life. It'll, that stress will begin to just take our, our years of life away. Third question, who of you, by worrying, is driving people in your life out of their minds. Because of our worry, it causes all kinds of rippling effects to those around us. Fourth question, who of you by worrying has upgraded your wardrobe or reduced your grocery bill? And Jesus talks about this. If you use worry to try to upgrade the clothes you wear or the food you eat, it's of no avail. It, it, it just doesn't work. And the fifth question, who of you by worrying has added value to what you value most? 
So we're going to find the answers to those five questions. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. The million-dollar question is this. How do we stop worrying? And we're, here's what's so brilliant about what Jesus says. He answers the question, how? He, does, he doesn't simply say, stop, don't do this. But he explains the process or the how of overcoming this strangulation in our life. And this is the cool thing about Jesus. He's teaching us this message, and it's for every one of us, regardless of your situation. If you're a Christian, listen up. This is going to help you. If you're not a Christian, this message may be the very thing that convinces you that he is worth following, and you'll become a Christian. Or maybe you used to be a Christian. Uh, you used to go to church, but then you get, just got busy and you became discouraged. Maybe you were hurt in church because of something somebody said, or you got angry at somebody, so you just decided, I'm, this isn't worth it. Well, this me message is for you. So it's for everyone. And Jesus is standing there. He's teaching people of all kinds of backgrounds and circumstances. And what he says about worry, worry is extraordinary. It's actually, it's brilliant. It is how to not worry. And this may be the very reason that you want to become a Christian or a follower of Christ. Now imagine if what Jesus says works. This is a prescription for overcoming worry, and it works, and it doesn't cost you anything. Doesn't it make sense to listen up? <laughs> so Jesus is giving these instructions to those of us that uh, kind of are overcome by worry, especially during this time of the, the global pandemic, and we're, we're finally coming uh, near the end here in the U.S., but I know there's still a lot of anxiety because of what this has done to our nation and what it's done to our communities and our, our jobs, uh, the economy. So there's still a lot of worry going around. Here's what Matthew 6, verse 25 says. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Now these were the primary concerns of the people who lived 2,000 years ago. Jesus was in Israel, and he's preaching to this crowd, and those people were constantly worried about their life because their life was day-to-day -day sustenance. I mean, they had no idea, some of them had no idea where their food was going to come from tomorrow. And so it was a hard life. In fact, for many of them, they weren't even sure where they were going to find water because water was scarce. And they certainly didn't know what they might wear because uh, their wardrobes were not full of clothes like our wardrobes or our closets are. So th this was speaking right to the primary concern of those people who were listening to Jesus. Now, most of us are not worried about what we're going to eat, although in the middle of this pandemic, there are many who are lining up at food banks and food pantries. But I don't think many of us are worried about will we have enough to eat uh, or finding something to drink. I mean, you can find water or soda on every corner of town or every exit on the highway. And I don't think many of us worry about what to wear. Most of us have closets full of clothes, so many, so many clothes that we got to keep giving stuff away or handing them down. The things that we worry about today are how, how am I going to pay the bills? Uh, we have marriage worries, we have job worries, we have health worries, we have schooling worries, trying to teach our kids, uh, finish up the semester, or we have financial worries, worries about how our kids are going to keep their jobs, worries about taking care of our aging parents. Or, so there's plenty of stuff to worry about. Jesus said, don't worry, because all of your worries are about the future about what happens tomorrow. Jesus goes on to say, and now listen, this is really important, verse 25, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Here's what Jesus is saying. Isn't it true that your life is more important than what you're worried about? If we put front and center that thing that we worry most about, our health, our safety, our finances, 
Isn't your life bigger than that? If you take everything into account, isn't your life bigger than that one thing you worry about? Now, health is a pretty important thing, and yet our lives are bigger than our health, isn't it? I mean, think about the impact of your life, the legacy you've, you have, the influence, the purpose of life, what you mean to others. All that is so much more important than what you worry about. So here's the first big idea. Now, this is a big thought. Are you ready? Life is bigger than what you worry about. Isn't it true that life is more important than paying the bills? And yet we worry about that all the time. Life is more important than homeschooling our kids or when do they go back to school? Or what am I going to do with them during the summer holidays? Uh, life is bigger than that. Who included you or excluded you on Facebook posts? I mean, life is bigger than that. Why do we worry about these things? What our kids are going to do this summer or what are, we, what are we going to eat tomorrow? Or what are we going to drink tomorrow? What are you going to wear tomorrow? Life is much bigger than the things we worry about. And Jesus goes on to say, verse 26, look at the birds in the air. It's almost like, wait a minute, Jesus, we're talking about something really important, worry. And you're, you're wanting us to look at the birds? Now remember, Jesus is standing on a hill and these people are sitting outside. So it could have been that a flock of birds was just flying by and Jesus points to them, look at these birds in the sky. In fact, uh, there at the Sea of Galilee, it's one of the, the places where there are so many birds that migrate from Europe down south when it begins to turn winter, or they fly north when it is turning spring. And so Israel becomes this place of migration. So there's thousands of different species of birds and so, in fact, uh, Israeli pilots, more are killed by birds coming through the cockpit of their jets than by enemies shooting them down because there's so many birds in Israel. There are special rules for pilots who fly into Tel Aviv airport because so many birds can get sucked into the jet engines. So Jesus was just pointing out, look at these birds. Even these birds of the air, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than these birds? What Jesus is saying is these birds have no capacity to think or plan or strategize on what will happen tomorrow. They just go about and they're, they're flying around and they see a worm, they come down, they, or that little uh, berry, and so they, they take care of their need for the moment. And yet we have been created in God's image and we are able to plan and think ahead and rationalize and, and logically uh, determine what, what our strategy is to get through this life. So Jesus is saying, you're far more important than what those birds can do, so don't worry about it. We have an advantage, so why worry? Then Jesus goes on to ask this question. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life or to anyone else's life? Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. These flowers have no concept of the future. They're not asking about how to increase productivity, how to increase bank accounts. Yet I tell you, Jesus says in verse 29, that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these flowers. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, it, it turns into hay and, and just dried up grass, so they collect it and they throw it in the fire. So we need to pay close attention here because Jesus is talking about how to overcome worry. And this gets to the very heart of what worry is all about. Will God, will he not much more clothe you? So Jesus is posing this question. He takes, God takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers. He dresses them up, makes them beautiful. I mean, this is picturesque language. It's poetic language. But he's, he's making the point, 
you are far more important and God's attention is on you much more than his attention on these smaller items. Now Jesus is taking us even deeper. Here's the million dollar question Jesus is asking his followers and, and us today. Do you trust that God can and will take care of you? This goes straight to the heart of worry. Do you trust that God can and will take care of you? If God has done what he has done in nature and for nature, and if God sees us far more valuable than the birds in the air and the flowers in the field, will he not take care of you? If we are more valuable to God than the grass that grows and, and dries up and is thrown into a fire, if we are indeed, and I believe we are, made in the image of God, can we trust God and believe he has our best interest in mind? Then Jesus makes a statement that seems to us that is almost criticizing or belittling the disciples or those listening. But if we look at what Jesus is about to say to them, and we understand the original phrase, it comes across as so winsome and, and endearing. It's the only time in the New Testament where these two Greek words are put together. It's almost like Matthew heard Jesus say these things, and it was a little bit of a riddle. And uh, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. Matthew wrote the scripture in Greek. So he was trying to figure out, how do I interpret what Jesus, how can I really make this uh, fit into the, what Jesus was saying in the context? In fact, these two Greek words that Matthew uses are never put together in any Greek literature. So it's very unusual how Matthew states this. It's a, it's a play on words. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. You of little faith. But if we take it the way Jesus meant it, this is how it's best interpreted. You little faithers, you. And the crowd laughed. Jesus was poking gentle fun at, at the disciples. He was saying, come on, how big is God? How important and valuable are you to him? Look at all that God has done for you. Look at how God takes care of the universe and the solar system. Look how he cares for the birds and the flowers. Why would you worry about him not being able to take care of you? You little faithers, you. It's all about trust. Our problem is we don't wake up every day trusting that God is waiting to take care of us today and God is preparing to take care of us tomorrow. Rather than trust God to have our best interest at heart, we reach out into tomorrow and we grab tomorrow's concern so we worry about them today. Can you see how ridiculous that is? <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is saying, your heavenly father has got this. He can handle this, don't worry. Because your heavenly father will be what you need him to be today and tomorrow. Let's see how Jesus states this. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 32, for the pagans, now let's not take this word to mean uh, those who are uh, wicked and terrible. What he's saying is everybody else who doesn't believe or doesn't follow me, so he's saying for those people, they run after these things, and Jesus is saying, quit acting like everybody else. You have more going for you. Then Jesus goes on to say, and your heavenly father knows that you need these things. Let's stop right there. This is huge. This could shake your world a little bit. Let me ask you this question. What if you were absolutely confident? What if you were absolutely sure that your heavenly father knows and this is 90% of the battle about worry, right? So imagine you're going to bed tonight and as you lay in bed, you're thinking about all the things you gotta do tomorrow and you're, you lay awake at night, you're thinking about next week, you're thinking about your kids this summer, 
you think about all these things that upset you, what if suddenly you heard God whisper to you as you lay there in your bed, I know, I know. What if you had an unwavering certainty, an abiding confidence that regardless of all that you think about worry and, and, and things that concern you, God is leaning over heaven's edge saying, I know, I know. Here is Jesus, the perfect expression of an invisible God. And Jesus is saying to all those people sitting on that hill, here's what he's saying, your heavenly Father knows. He knows what you need. He knows the uncertainties you face. He knows you and how that uncertainty affects you. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. Look what, what Jesus says next. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now the word seek first is actually in the original language, it's actually the same word that is used just a couple of verses before this, where it says the pagans or the, everybody else runs after these things. And that's what he's saying. Run after this, seek it first. Make it the highest priority in your life. His righteousness, his kingdom. So this is the point of the message. When we worry, it's as though those uncontrollable things have a stranglehold on us, and it causes our hearts and our minds to run to certain assumptions. We create certain scenarios, and our minds go racing after those thoughts. Jesus is saying, stop, your heavenly father's got that. He knows exactly what you need. So stop running after those thoughts and run after his thoughts for you, his love for you. Run after him. Instead of running after and seeking first those things you have no control over, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you or given to you as well. This is what Jesus is saying. When you are tempted to borrow from tomorrow, and reach into tomorrow looking for a way to remind yourself that these things are, are gonna happen, oh no, I don't know if I got, I got this, and yet God is reminding us, I've got it, I know. I've got it covered. I'll take care of those needs. Now, Jesus is about to drop some knowledge here. So are you ready? Just so we can get the full weight of what he's about to say, I want you to think of the top three things that make you worry. Okay? I'm going to give you a moment. To, in your mind, think of the three things that concern you most about tomorrow or the coming few days or weeks or, or months. What is the big worry you have? Do you have those things in mind? Now let's look at what Jesus says. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about fill in the blank with your worry. Now Jesus uses the word tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow. But what he's saying is whatever that concern is, whatever you're worried about tomorrow, that you can fill in the blank there with your concern. Jesus wants his listeners to relabel those things with the word tomorrow. So every time you think of well, I don't know if I can pay the bills, or I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids, or I don't know about the, this economy. And my, uh, I don't know about... Don't worry about tomorrow. What he's saying is, it's not the bill that's having to be paid that's your worry. What you're really worried about is tomorrow is uncontrollable, right? It's out of our control, so we worry about it. For one generation, the worries were food, water, and clothes. For our generation, it's a job, enough money to pay the bills, roof over our heads. But whatever that worry is, don't reach into tomorrow and bring those worries into today. Jesus says, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. I love that because Jesus is not saying, ah, just, just take it easy, don't worry about it, everything's going to work out. No, he's saying, tomorrow will bring trouble, but don't worry about that. The point is Jesus is making, and this is point number two in my message, don't worry because your heavenly Father is with you today 
and he will be waiting on you tomorrow. In conclusion, I want you to think about these two questions. These are two questions for all of you who follow Jesus. Those of you that maybe haven't decided to follow Jesus or, or maybe you were a Christian and now you're not any longer because of circumstances that have happened. So you, I want you to listen in, but this is really for those who decided, I'm gonna follow Jesus. I wanna do what he tells me to do. So these two questions are for you. What if you really believed that God has it covered? What would that do for you? That God really knows your need and his interest is for your good. That God knows about tomorrow. He's capable of handling those things for you. What if you really believe that? Second question, why not believe that? Some might say, well, I'm... I'm not gonna believe that because it's just crazy. It's ridiculous to not have any worries. I mean, how can I live like that? Somebody else might say, well, I'm not sure it will work, so uh, that's why I don't believe it. Somebody else might say, I I'm not gonna believe because God didn't come through the last time for me. Here's the thing. If you choose not to put your faith in what Jesus is asking you to do, if you choose not to believe that God has your best interest at heart, and as you seek him first, he will take care of your needs for today, and he'll be waiting to help you tomorrow. If you choose not to trust God, you're, you're actually choosing to trust worry. Which one is more dependable for you to trust, worry or your heavenly father? What if my whole message for you today was trust and worry, trust and worry with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge worry and worry will direct your path, and worry will make your life better. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Why, why would we put our trust or our faith in worry? If, if that was what I was teaching today, do you know what you would say to me? You would say, Tom, that's crazy. Why would, why would I ever believe that? Or Tom, I know that doesn't work, so I'm not gonna believe that. Or Tom, worry never has come through for me in the past, so I'm not gonna believe that. Remember, Jesus was teaching this right at the beginning of his ministry. His followers were a bunch of little faithers. Then at the very end, where Jesus is gonna go to the cross, they're still worrying about this happening and that happening. What, if you leave us, please don't leave us. Jesus told him, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to heaven to prepare a place for you. And they were like, oh no, please don't leave us. So Jesus says this to his followers, John 14, verses one and five. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe God. So Jesus there is saying, believe God, trust God. He knows. Believe also in me. This is the exact same message he had given to those people there in Matthew 6 on the Sermon on the Mount. Believe in God. He knows your need. He is trustworthy. And then Jesus goes on to say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. What Jesus is saying is, I'm not giving you the kind of peace the world gives to you. The world has no certainty about the future. I give you the peace that the world can't give to you. So don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But then Jesus died. He was nailed to a cross, finished. All those promises of peace, all those promises Jesus get, and it left the disciples feeling worried. What are we gonna do now? What's gonna to happen tomorrow? And we know that Peter denied Jesus and, and the, many of the disciples were feeling empty and hopeless, like everything was gone. But then Jesus rose from the dead and suddenly, the whole idea, the idea of not worrying about tomorrow made perfect sense. Because when someone can predict their own death and resurrection and then pull it off, you don't need to worry, you believe them. And the disciples were then able to embrace the idea that they did not need to worry or fear. So, going back to the New Testament times, Jesus 
died on the cross, he rose again, proving that his promises are trustworthy. And then 30 years passes. So the church is starting to grow, and along comes this guy, Paul, who became the Apostle Paul. He decided he was going to follow after Jesus. He was going to follow in the footsteps of his Savior, his Master. And here's what he writes to the believers in Philippi. So this is 30 years later. A lot's happened. The church has gone through terrible persecution. They have lots of things they can worry about. And here's what Paul says. Philippians 4, 5, and 7. The Lord is near. Just like Jesus was saying, God is there. He'll cover this. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. Do not be anxious about anything. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We really only have two options. Will you choose to worry? Or will you choose to trust? Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you for the promise that you not only give, but you explain so in such detail here in Matthew 6, where Jesus talks about how we can overcome worry. Lord, we don't want this strangulation of anxiety that, that keeps us up at night or, or is on our minds when we wake up in the morning. Oh God, I pray that we will trust you completely and not keep owning or, or grabbing into the future the things we can't control and just believe, oh God, you know about these things. You know, and you care deeply. And so we can trust you. Lord, I pray anybody who's listening to this, or watching this, if they're worried and they're trusting in worry, they're depending on all the worries that they have, I pray at this very moment, they'll transfer that trust and place it in Jesus Christ, who is trustworthy and can, can be believed. His promises are true. He proved it by his resurrection. So we cast our care on you because you, because you care for us. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for listening in. This may be the last time we do this recording. Uh, we're hoping that we can start to gather in church with social distancing and all of the special requirements. Uh, and that news will be going out, uh, giving real clarity on how we're going to do this. But uh, thank you again for listening. And I, I just pray God blesses you this coming week.